the river is moving, the blackbird must be flying. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our special Blackbird Poetry Festival event, the 2021 Nightbird Reading entitled Reimagining Language and Silence, the Poetry of Ilya Kaminsky. My name is Tara Hart, and I'm co-chair of the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society, our beloved Hoko Palazzo. I'm also a professor of humanities at Howard Community College, where the Office of Student Life and the academic divisions of English World Languages and Arts and Humanities come together with Hoka Pulitzo in festival partnership and funding. Earlier today, many students and community members came together for a workshop with our featured guest poet, Mr. Kaminsky, and to lend their voices to the Sunbird reading in the afternoon with live commentary and readings by Mr. Kaminsky and his host poet, Terry Ellen Cross Davis. I invited everyone in the spirit of the words of poet Padraig Otuma to pay hospitable attention when in the company of people who are trying to put words around our largest, most complex human experiences. We offered each other that hospitality in the exchanges of ideas and poems throughout the day. Tonight, we are privileged not only to immerse ourselves more deeply in the experience of Mr. Kaminsky's work and to see him in conversation with Ms. Davis, but to welcome another young person as a guest to this feast, Paula Yeboa from Wild Lake High School, the second place winner of the renowned National Endowment of the Arts Poetry Out Loud contest. After a short film celebrating the history of the Blackbird Festival, you'll see Ms. Yeboa recite two poems. The first is Emily Dickinson's Much Madness is Divinest Sense, followed by Emily Dickinson at the Poetry Slam, a poem by Dan Vera. After this treat, Terry Allen Cross Davis will introduce Ilya Kaminsky and later moderate a question and answer session. Ms. Davis is the award-winning author of two poetry collections, including her newest and much lauded one entitled A More Perfect Union. Of that collection, Camille Dun Dungy said, you'll find resilience and resistance and rough sweet magic in these poems. You'll find the truth. She is a Cave Canem Fellow, the recipient of many distinguished awards and grants and an ardent poetry ambassador for our region in her service to organizations like Split This Rock, Poetry Out Loud, and the Black Ladies Brunch Collective. It was at one of Terry's beautifully curated events that she designed in her role as the poetry coordinator for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC, that some of us here first saw Ilya Kaminsky read in person, and that led to our invitation to him to join us here for Blackbird. Please make yourselves comfortable in our cozy virtual space to savor first our short film and poetry recitations, and then to welcome Terry Allen Cross Davis as our gracious host to an evening of poetry with Ilya Kaminsky. Enjoy. My name is Renee May, and I am a professor of literature here at Howard Community College. It is my privilege to welcome you to the Blackbird Poetry Festival. The Blackbird Festival first took flight in 2009 and is inspired by the poem 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird by Wallace Stevens, a poem that continually reminds us to see the world in different ways. Stevens uses the eponymous blackbird as a sort of muse that appears in myriad forms throughout the poem. I first encountered this poem as a sophomore at the University of Baltimore in Kendra Kapelke's Ways of Seeing Poetry class. As a sort of ritual, Kendra had us read the poem in different ways at the start of every class, taking the poem apart and putting it back together changing its noble accents each time. At the beginning of each festival, we have used Stephen's poem as an invocation to call upon our muses and open ourselves to the power of poetry. This year, we celebrate the 13th Blackbird Poetry Festival, 
and in honor of the many blackbirds that have shared their poetry with us and have inspired us to constantly reframe the world, we've created a tribute that reimagines the poem as we also look back with great appreciation at the Blackbird Festival poets we have welcomed over the years. Much Madness is Divine Ascent by Emily Dickinson. Much Madness is Divine Ascent to a discerning eye. Much sense this darkest madness. Tis the majority in all this prevail. Ascent, and you are sane. Demure, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. Emily Dickinson at the Poetry Slam by Dan Vera. I will tell you why she really ventured from her house. It happened like this. One day she took the train to Boston, made her way to the darkened room, 
put her name down in cursive script and waited her turn. When they read her name aloud, she made her way to the stage. Straightened the papers in her hands, pages and envelopes, the backs of grocery bills. She closed her eyes for a minute, took a breath, and began. From her mouth, perfect words exploded. Intact formulas of light and darkness. She dared to rhyme with words like cochineal and describe the skies like diadem. Obscurely worded incantations filled the room with an alchemy that made the very molecules quake. The solitary words she handled in her upstairs room with keen precision came rumbling out to make the electric lights flicker. 40 members of the audience were treated for hypertension. 20-year-old dark-haired beauties found their heads had turned a mosses white. Her second poem erased the memory of every cell phone in the nightclub. And by the fourth line of the sixth verse, the grandmother in the upstairs apartment had been cured of her rheumatism. The papers reported the power outages, the area hospitals taxed their emergency generators, and sirens were heard to wail through the night. Quietly, she made her way to the exit, walked to the terminal, and rode back to Amherst. She never left her room again, and never read such syllables aloud. Welcome to the 13th Annual Blackbird Poetry Festival and to the Nightbird. My name is Terry Ellen Cross Davis, and it's my pleasure to introduce the incredible Ilya Kaminsky. Here are the biographical details about Mr. Kaminsky. He was born in Odessa, former Soviet Union in 1977, and arrived to the United States in 93 when his family was granted asylum by the American government. He's the author of Deck Republic and Dancing in Odessa, and co-editor and co-translator of many other books, including Echo Anthology of International Poetry and Dark Elderberry Branch, poems of Marina Svetova. His work has won many prizes and fellowships, including the Los Angeles Times Book Award, the Annisfeld Book Award, the National Jewish Book Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Whiting Award, the American Academy of Arts and Letters Metcalf Award, a Lannan Fellowship, Academy of American Poets Fellowship, NEA Fellowship, and Poetry Magazine's Levinson Prize. His poems have been translated into over 20 languages, and his books are published in many countries, including Turkey, the Netherlands, Germany, Russia, France, Mexico, Macedonia, Romania, Spain, and China, where his poetry was awarded the Yin Shan International Poetry Prize. In 2019, Kaminsky was selected by BBC as one of the 12 artists that changed the world. Mr. Kaminsky has worked as a law clerk for San Francisco Legal Aid and the National Immigration Law Center. More recently, he worked pro bono as the court appointed special advocate for orphan children in Southern California. Currently, he holds the Bourne Chair in Poetry at Georgia Institute of Technology and lives in Atlanta. Poetry luminaries have praised his superb and vigorous imagination. Reading his work feels like a re-knitting of the universe and his lines become the necessary oxygen you need to breathe. His metaphors and his vision become a new way of experiencing the word. What I'm trying to tell you is that reading Ilya Kaminsky's work, I feel like I can breathe again and that's no small feat as a black woman in America. So to take less of your time and give you more time with his work, please welcome Ilya Kaminsky. Thank you so, so very much, Terry Ellen Cross Davis, for those very kind words and for your own very beautiful reading earlier today, which I truly loved. Thank you. And thank you all for being here today and for letting me be a part of your community. I'm very grateful. Having said that, I'm just going to read some poems. And um, I know it's late in the afternoon, early evening, so I'm going to try to avoid boring you too much. Um, I speak with a pretty heavy Russian accent, so I hope it might be possible to share the PDF with the poem so folks can follow. Unless, of course, you also all want to speak with a heavy Russian accent by the end of this evening. Um, I'm going to read about three poems. Two of them are very short at the beginning and at the end. 
and in the middle um, is a longer story in verse uh, called Deaf Republic. So the first poem is called We Lived Happily During the War. We lived happily during the war. And when they bombed in other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed, and on my bed, America was falling. Invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun in the sixth month of a disastrous rain in a house of money, in a street of money, in a city of money, in a country of money, or great country of money. We forgive us, live happily during the war. So Deaf Republic begins with the scene of a pregnant woman and her husband at a public gathering. They see a soldier shoot and kill a young deaf boy. And um, in response to that murder, the whole community decides to protest by refusing to hear the authorities. Deaf Republic, gunshot. Our country is a stage. When soldiers march into town, public assemblies are officially prohibited. But today, neighbors flock to the piano music from Sony and Alfonso's puppet show in Central Square. Some of us have climbed up into trees. Others had beyond benches and telegraph posts. When Petya, the deaf boy in the front row, sneezes, the surgeon puppet collapses, shrieking. He stands up against North Chase's feast of the laughing audience. An army gym swerves into the square, disgorging its servant sergeant. Disperse immediately! Disperse immediately. The puppet mimics in a wooden falsetto. Everyone freezes except Petya, who keeps giggling. Someone claps a hand over his mouth. The surgeon turns toward the boy raising his finger. You! You, the puppet raises a finger. Sonia watches her puppet. The puppet watches the surgeon. The surgeon watches Sonia and Alfonso. But the rest of us watch Peter Alim back, gather all the speed in his road and launch it at the surgeon. The sound we do not hear is the gas of the bullet. A soldier's march, Alfonso covers the boy's face with a newspaper. For the people, most of us strangers, watch on a kneel by Peter shot in the middle of the street. She picks up his spectacles, shining like two coins, bursts in them on his nose, observes this moment. How it convulses. No fuss, and the ducks run into the streets like medics. Fourteen of us watch. So he kisses his forehead, her shot a hole torn in the sky. It shimmered the park bunches, porch lights we see. In Sonia's open mouth, the nakedness of the whole nation. She stretches out beside the little snowman. Napping in the middle of the street, as picking up its spirit, the country runs. Alfonso in snow. You're alive, I whispered to myself, there for something and you listen. Something around down the street falls, fails to get up. I run, etc., with my legs and my hands behind my pregnant wife, etc., down the Vasenka Street. I run, etc., it only takes a few minutes, etc., to make a man.
Daphnis, an insurgency begins. Our country woke up next morning and refused to hear soldiers. In the name of Peter, we refuse. At 6 a.m., when soldiers complimenting girls in the alleyway, the girls slide by pointing to their ears. At 8, the bakery door is shut and soldiers Ivan of Faith know he is the best customer. At 10, Mama Gala chokes, no one hears you at the gates of the soldiers' barracks. By 11 a.m., arrest begins. Our hearing doesn't weaken, but something silent in us trenches. After curfew, families of the arrested hung homemade puppets out of their windows. The streets empty, but for the squeaks of string and the tap, tap against the buildings, a wooden fist and feet. In the ears of the town, snow falls. Alfonso stands and swivel. My people, you wanna read something fucking fun? On the morning of the first arrest, our man once frightened and bound to their beds now stand up like a human mass deafness, passes through us like a police whistle. Here's a night testify, each of us comes home, shuts at the wall at the stove, at the refrigerator, let himself forgive me. I was honest with you, life to you. I stand answerable. I ran, etc. With my legs and my hands, etc. I ran down Wasn't Catherine, etc. Whoever listens, sent you. But the father of my time sent you for our argument that I am sent you for deafness, love, such fire from a march to never. that may perform an open cause. I watched the surgeon tell that a boy they carry and fire in his mouth, his face on the asphalt, that map of blood and open it was. It is the air, something in the air wants us too much. The earth is still. The tiger guards eat cucumber sandwiches. It's first day soldiers examine the ears of bartenders, accountant soldiers. The wicked then silence dust to soldiers that are gonna survive from her bed like a door of a bath. Absurd this moment. How it convulses. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like a paper clip. The body of the boy lies on the asphalt like the body of a boy. I touch the walls, feel the pulse of the house, and I stay up wordless and do not know why I am alive. We keep toes the city, so I can die. Between theaters and guardians and rot iron gates, be courageous, we say, but no one. Is courageous as a sign. We do not hear leaves the birds open, open. Before the war, you made a child. I kissed a woman whose fragile service and neighbor. She had a mole on her shoulder which she displayed like a medal for bravery. Her trembling lips man come to bed. Her hair, water falling in the middle of the conversation man come to bed. I walked in my barber shop of this. Yes, I zipped her off to bed on the chair of my hairy arms, but part at least, but bite my part at least. Lying under the cool sheet, Sonia, the things we did. Soldiers aim at us. Soldiers. They fire 
The crowd of women flee inside the nostrils of searchers. My God, have a photograph of this. The piano's bright air. So this drug Peter's body and his head bang the stairs. I feel through my wife's shirt the shape of our child. So this drug Peter up the stairs and homeless dog in us philosophers understand everything and bark and bark. I, now on a bridge with no camouflage of speech, a body wrapping the body of my pregnant wife. Tonight, we don't die and don't die. The earth is still. A helicopter, I both my wife on earth. A man cannot flip a finger at the sky because each man is already a finger flipped at the sky, lullaby. Lullaby. Little daughter, rain, water, snow, and branches protect you. White watch it was, and neighbor's hands, oh, child of my aprons, little lord of Six pounds, my white hair keeps you asleep, lit. While the child sleeps, Sonia undresses. She scraps me until I spit soapy water peak. She smiles, a man should smell better than his country. Such is the silence of a woman who speaks again silence, knowing that silence is what moves us to speak. She throws my shoes and glasses in the air. I'm of deaf people, and I have no country but a bus stop and an infant and a marriage bed. Soaping together, that is sacred to us, watching each other's shoulders. You can trust anyone. But with whom can you see it in water? Poem from Barton. My body runs in a Loma street, my clothes in a pillowcase. I look for a man who looks exactly like me to give him my Sonia, my name, my shirt. It has begun, neighbors claim that rollies at the fish market break it all their moments and half. Trolleys barts like intestines in the sun. I will shut, I am so fucking beautiful, I cannot stand it. Two boys still holding tomato sandwiches, hop in a trolley, slice, so do say, but their faces, they hear. I can't find my wife where I is, my pregnant wife. I, a body, an adult male awaits to explode like a hand grenade. It has begun. I see the blue canary of my country. Big breadcrumbs from which stitches and sides. Big breadcrumbs from my neighbor's head. The snow leaves the earth and falls straight up as it should. To hell, a country so important. To run into walls, into streetlights, into loved ones as one should. The blue canary of my country runs into walls, into streetlights, into loved ones. The blue canary of my country watches their legs as they run. And fall. A cigarette. A cigarette. Watch. Washington citizens do not know they are evidence of happiness. In a time of war, each is a recital document of love. Watch God. They have something to tell that not even they can hear. 
Climber roof in the center square of this bumpy down city you will see one neighbor gives a cigarette, another gives a dagger, a pint of sunlit beer. You will find God like a dumb pigeon's beak. I am packing every which way at astonishment. Fire squad. Fire squad. On balconies, sunlight. On poplars, sunlight. On our wheels. Today, no one is shooting. A girl cut her hair with imaginary scissors. The scissors in sunlight, her hair and sunlight. Another girl nicks a pair of shoes from its sleeping soldiers covered with light. A soldier's wave and gape at us, gaping at them. What do they see? Tonight, they chat 50 room at Lerner Street. I sit down to write and tell you what I know. A child learns the world by putting it in her mouth. A girl becomes a woman and a woman earth body. They blame you for all things. And they speak in the body. What does not live in the body? The townspeople watch them take. Alfonso. Now, each of us is a witness stand. Washington, which is out of watch for soldiers, row Alfonso Brabinski on a sidewalk, feel at them taking all of us cowards, but we don't say, we carry in our suitcases, our coat. Our nostrils. Across the street, they watch him with fire hoses. First, he screams, then he stops. So much sunlight. A t shirt falls off a clothes line, and an old man stops, picks it up, presses it to his face. Neighbors line up to watch him throw on the sidewalk like a muddy milk. In so much sunlight. Each of us is a witness stand. They take Alfonso and no one stands up. Our silence stands up for us. In a time of peace, Inhabitants of Earth for 40 something years. I once found myself in a peaceful country. I watched the neighbors open their phones to watch a cop demanding a man's driver license. And when a man reaches for his wallet, the cop shoots into the car window. Shoots. Peaceful country. We pack at our phones and go to the dentist to pick up the children from school to buy shampoo. Amazing. Ours is a country in which a boy shot by police lies on a pavement for us to see with his open mouth the nakedness of the whole nation. We watch, watch others, watch the body of a girl lies on a pavement, exactly like the body of a boy. It is a peaceful country, and it clips our citizens' bodies separately, the way the president's wife trims her toenails. All of us. 
still have to do the hard work of dentist appointments of remembering to make a summer salad, basil, tomatoes is in his joy, tomatoes and a little salt. This is the time for peace. I don't hear gunshots, but watch the birds splash over the backyards of the suburbs. How bright is the sky. The avenue spins and it sucks. How bright is the sky for dear me? How bright. Hi, Ilya. Such, I, I had to keep the tears from coming as I listened to you read because it moves me so much. And the passion, the intellect, the insight, all of it, all of it. So I am going to put my questions in the chat as well as as tell them to you. So let's see. I'll put them two at a time. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. Well, first we'll just start with this one. Um, let me see. I have to go back and just, yeah, there we go. Okay. My first question for you is I noticed. Um, and I apologize, I keep, I keep uh, cutting my questions. Okay, there okay, we go. I have questions. <laughs> I know, I, I have questions, I have questions. And actually, I'll just send them to you. Okay, so there's the first one. Is there an origin story for Deaf Republic? Uh, a tipping point when the entirety of the story revealed, them, revealed itself to you or did these poems come one by one and you eventually realized that they were entirely connected? Um, this is a great question and I wish I had a straightforward answer. Um, number one, thank you for your beautiful reading today. Oh. Really, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I hope this conversation well, won't be just uh, me talking, but I thought it about poetry because why not? Um, for me, um, this book was a little bit, I don't want to say different because I only have two books, but my first book was kind of easy to write because um, I was a kid who came here at 16 and um, my, my father died pretty early after we came uh, to America. And um, I began to write in English partly because I knew to write about him, but I didn't want my family to follow, you know? Um, so it was kind of a private thing that I didn't plan it, the book of poets or anything. Um, and it, it was also a conversation, of course, with Russian poets of the past, the Eastern European poets of the past and all that. So that, that was easy. And then um, when I published it in 2004, I, uh, yeah, in 2004, I was in America for about 11 years. And I had to ask myself, okay, what am I going to do next? Am I going to jump around and pretend like I'm a Russian poet, even though I don't live in Russia, you know? And at that time I moved to San Diego, which is known as um, America's finest city or America's happiest city. And the first thing a poet does when they move somewhere, they go to Home Depot to buy the nails to put the bookshelves in the wall, you know? And uh, when you go to Home Depot in San Diego, you see a lot of images people see on TV right now and horrified. Uh, those, those images were not on TV in 2004. People had been dragged to ice car because they stood outside of Home Depot and wanted to have somebody move, you know, and the children watching horror. That is America's finest city, San Diego. Mm. Um, that happened around the same time when um, Ukraine and Russian conflict was happening. Uh, Russia invaded part of Ukraine. Uh, part of Ukraine is still occupied. So what of the things were on my mind, and I, I keep going to Ukraine once every couple of years for sure. And uh, the strangest thing that began to happen is I began to see that a lot of the images 
um, completely different countries of Genoa. And uh, you know, I come from an Indian family, we came for American dream, we came for propaganda of American dream. Yes. And to see the um, images in a country at war, um, you know, the world's largest empire on, on the other side, or Ukraine, a small country at war being occupied, um, being similar was a shock. And I thought, okay, how, how can I talk about this? Partly because if I tell the story from a standpoint of somebody who is Ukrainian refugee about Ukraine and Russia and being Jewish, um, it would be a part of me, my childhood, but it wouldn't be who I am now mm -hmm. because I live in this country now. But if I just pretend like I'm writing as an American, um, you know, I've never heard a lullaby in English. And it's just never, never had that experience. I didn't grow up here. No, my mother never sang me a lullaby in English. So how do I find a way to speak about both? It was something that this book needed to do for me, even more so than any story as such. The story changes. Uh, the main part of the story is influenced by my family history. My grandfather was shot as enemy of the people in 1937, and my grandmother went to Siberia for 10 years. And my father was that stolen baby. There is a stolen baby in the book. And um, the, that story is similar to my father's. Um, but the urgency of the book in some ways comes from being in the United States as well. And of course, the first poem and the last poem in the book are very American poems. And I needed to find images that speak to both of those experiences. For both of us, any refugee or immigrant uh, or misplaced person is somebody who lives in more than one world, one food in both worlds. And in some ways, for me, this book needed to be honest to both experiences. And um, the images of the book, like a famous American image, the image that you cannot imagine American 2020 without, is um, a boy shot by an officer. Uh, you know, lying in the middle of the street and everybody is walking by. That is an American image. Um, it is also Ukrainian image. And it fell too for both. And once I got that, once I understood, oh, okay, there's a language of images that can feel true to me, that I don't feel like I'm just making a pretty art out of it, you know? And I'm one of those boys who likes to make pretty art. That's one of my dangers. I know that um, I'm fighting for my French a soccer for, for, for beauty. Mm -hmm. um, so I love metaphors. Uh, the, the, book, the book is full of metaphors. But I knew that the book would be not complete until the metaphors stop at some point, uh, because the metaphors are not enough at some point. There are some things for which beauty is grown. And we need to just speak plainly and honestly with each other. Mm -hmm. And once I figured those moments out that were through the both Ukrainian and American experience in images, but not necessarily in metaphors, I knew, okay, now this story is coming closer to what I wanted to do. I, I'm sorry, it's a long game. <laughs> no, I'm trying to hold the tears back because you, you, you've dropped so much knowledge in one answer that I'm just having to digest it. Um, there's a time when you said, you know, when metaphors are not enough and we just have to speak honestly and truthfully to each other. So I just, I want to honor what you said and I just think it's beautiful. Uh, so you, you spoke about metaphors. I will come back to your metaphors in a moment, but I have another question for you. And I put it in the chat earlier. Revisiting Deaf Republic, it felt even more relevant after the summer of 2020 and the death of George Floyd, one among many in the history of this country. What has been your take on the gradual awakening in this country of so many white Americans to state sanctioned violence against people of color? But your question is, do I think it's more relevant? What, what's your take on the gradual awakening in this country? I think it is a very delayed thing that should have happened what, 300 years ago or more, you know. I mean, we all know that. Uh, people love to say right now that, you know, Donald, Donald Trump was horrible and, um, you know, we are back to normal or before that was normal, but it was not normal. Donald Trump was just an ugly, 
uh, face without a mask. Um, and we, we have to come to terms with that. We have to realize that it is not Donald Trump, it's the rest of us. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, partly because my father's parents live it under Stalin and died under Stalin. Um, a lot of that kind of questioning was always present in my family. And um, one thing my father said very early on, you know, Stalin wouldn't be able to be Stalin without the rest of, of the people who are reporting on each other, you mm. know. And um, we don't live in Stalin's Russia, we don't live in Nazi Germany, because Stalin's Russia and Nazi Germany were 100 years ago, Nazism, like all other things, evolves. We live in the modern version. Let's be honest about that. Uh, modern version takes very different forms. It doesn't need to put, to, to take the same forms that we see on TV, you know, should this list. But it doesn't mean that there is no violence done to individuals in many different forms. Um, I think that everybody knows it. And if you don't know it, then you probably don't want to know it. Mm -hmm. And that is yet another reflection um, how dictatorial state evolves over time. We think we have a democracy because we can vote, some of us can vote. Um, okay, but is it a participatory democracy on a daily basis or is it a symbolic democracy that happens once every four years? Hmm. And democracy as well evolves. I mean, people seem to think that constitution, an 18th century document is something that should remain in 18th century. But what kind of conversation is that? And I mean, I can talk about that a lot, you know, uh, but you already know all my answers, I think. I, I do, but I wanted everyone else to, I mean, I can't say I do know, but I had a feeling. How's that? Uh, <laughs> so here's my next question for you. And someone else asked this in the chat. So she and I were on the same wavelength. I noticed in Deaf Republic, the word et cetera, et cetera, is frequently repeated. And I wanted to ask you about that, et cetera. Is that a door for anyone to paint themselves into the poem, into the experience of the poem? What's the, what's the purpose of those et cetera's for you? Um, I wish, uh, that's a very smart question. I wish, I wish uh, I was as smart as you invented that. I was just using it as a kind of punctuation you know, the kind of a musical device, if you will. Um, I wish I was smart as you. <laughs> uh, that, that would be, a, a, maybe for the next form, I'll steal this. <laughs> I'll steal the next form, because that's kind of a brilliant to find the language into which anyone can step in. And um, it's not necessarily a positive stepping in, mm -hmm. but it happens. Right? and to make a person feel like, oh, I step it into that, where do I go from there? How do I step out of it, right? Right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna steal that, thank you. <laughs> Happy to help. Uh, so my next question for you, your metaphors are so original and inventive. One reviewer talked about them in Dancing Odessa. I noticed them in both that book and Deaf Republic. How does the language come to you? Does straddling the fence between Russian and English give you give you a perspective that informs your creativity? Well, thank you. Thank you, first of all, um, for your question and for saying this. I'm going to go on and try to give a more personal answer and then a more practical answer, because I'm sure there are poets in the room who might want to just think about metaphors, you know. My personal answer is I didn't have hearing aids before mm -hmm. I came to the US. Um, which I didn't give much thought about way after I finished dancing in, in, in Odessa. Um, when I was writing Deaf Republic, I had to think a lot more about what deafness meant to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized that, oh, I really always thought in the images because I was lip reading. And noticing as I started to write down, how do I lip read? And I realized that when I lip read, I don't just see person's lips, but I also see what is happening. I, I, that's why I'm afraid. I see behind them somebody opening a newspaper, giving an article, not liking it, tossing it away. So I decided, no, I'm going to read it again and opening it again. Then there is a dog passing by, as a car drives by. I mean, all the life of the street, the life of a room, 
Um, sometimes we enter this, this sentence in the lips, another time just a little bit. But it is always a language of images. It's kind of far more native than a spoken language to me. And not by choice. And I didn't even think about it until I had to ask myself those questions. Um, but that's personal. In more practical writer kind of way, um, I think that to my mind, a good metaphor would consist obviously of an image plus abstraction. The question is what comes first? And I'm gonna give you kind of a, a very gross but very memorable metaphor, and it would be just a good example. Uh, it's from Yehuda Amichai, a uh, poet writing in Hebrew. He um, has a line that says, God's hand in this world is like my mother's hand inside the belly of a solitary chicken. I think it grows, but very memorable, very smart in a way. God's hand in this world is like my mother's hand inside the belly of a slaughtered chicken. Mm. Hard to forget <laughs> what you remember, right? But I, you know, I talked earlier today, some folks might have been in, in, in a class I did, and I said I underlined in the books I read, I, I, I try to refrain from underlining the whole poem or just loving the whole poem and try to ask myself, what are the lines that make me remember years later or so forth. And so I underlined that and um, at the back of the book, I always try to write my imitations. And I, I was stumbling for a while with that particular thing because what comes first, an abstraction or an image? Mm. And so as I was imitating it, I'm thinking, well, if I say God's hand of this world, where would I go from there? Mm. There are thousands of possibilities and I feel overwhelmed. But if I start with an image, it's so easy to go, just, just make a list of abstractions, say music, say opera, say God, say, say, say boy, whatever it is. And either some of them will fit well, others not so well, but the metaphor is immediately mm -hmm. mm, That's a beautiful, beautiful answer. I had to write some of that down. Image plus construction equals a good metaphor. And you hit the nail on the head. Like sometimes going into it, if you start with something, it can overwhelm you and there's no way into the language. So I really, really love that answer. And that leads me to my next question. So much of your work feels cinematic to me. How important is place and placement for you in your work? Um, I guess I would just come back just a little bit to where you just left off. When we think about image and abstraction, um, so image is obvious, you gotta have a vivid image, so you have to have an interesting noun, and then you gotta set that noun in motion with some kind of verb. And I collect words, I collect nouns, I collect verbs, I collect adjectives. Mm -hmm. And um, I have boxes on my table, I stole that from a poet I studied with Kevin Porsche who had multiple boxes on her table and she actually cut up words and lines and put them in those boxes. And I thought, oh, what, what a great idea, I'm going to do that. And it was very helpful for me because it really creates, I'm a physical person, visual person, so it creates the words right physically in my hands one at a time. Um, and then I thought, oh, well, abstractions can be abstractions, but they also need to be meaning meaningful to me. So what are the abstractions for my emotions? What are the abstractions for the impossible questions? Dostoevsky once said the difference between a literary novel and um, you know, the bestseller which you read and you forget is um, the literary writer sits down and they, don't necessarily have the full plot right away. They have impossible question and they write the whole novel in order to answer it. Hmm. Whereas the best already knows what's gonna happen, when and how, what's the conflict and so forth, you know. And hmm. there's a little bit of metaphysical urgency or political urgency or any other kind of urgency to which you don't know the answer. And your craft, your poetic devices, need to answer that for you. And so mm -hmm. why not apply that say to a metaphor? 
Mm. So what is my impossible question? What is the abstraction for my impossible question? And that would be the God, right, part? And then which of all those images I have in my boxes or in my journals that, that can possibly answer or attempt to answer that impossible question? Um, but moving now to your second question about placement, that's where images are, right? A wall bounds the street I see a cat cleaning herself, or a bird cleaning, another bird on the balcony, or a grandmother talking to a kid, you know, somebody washing the car, or another dog sleeping on the top of that car, while somebody is washing that car. So the, the world is full of images, the images are free for the taking. <laughs> Uh, or sometimes I just go for the nouns, you know, the nouns are creating the world. They can also be very boring if it's just nouns. So how do I jumpstart that form? That's where the verbs come in, you know. And um, there are so many different poets one can read for those things. For example, for verbs, for very interesting use of verbs, two poets, uh, Bridget, Bridget Peach and Kelly. Mm. Uh, in a book called Sound, and Rita Dove in a book called Thomas and You, which is a great book. Um, both of them use verbs in a way that is kind of impressionist, kind of poetic, but still delivers the narrative. Um, and so once one notices other poets do that, one begins to look for what kind of words one can collect. And then you, my obsession change you know, the impossible question change. So different poetic devices become interesting. Dancing in Odessa to begin with was um, very much a book written in the images, not so much in sound. Um, in that Republic, I thought, okay, well, I, I didn't ever hear lullabies in English, so why don't I write one? And I thought, okay, who can teach me how to write a lullaby? Well, Mother Goose is a collection of lullabies. So that, that, that was just trying to, and I knew that I couldn't go too much into sound in, in Russian. When I wrote in Russian, that was very formal. It's a very formal tradition. But I knew that in English, it would be seen Sunday. It's such a much a longer tradition, such an oldest tradition. Russian literature began in 19th century when Alexander Pushkin, the founder, so to speak, of Russian poetry, was writing in Yenigin, 1824. It's not a very long time ago. Um, so in Russian language to write on rhyme is very easy. There are so many rhymes not used yet. In English it is somewhat different story. So I had to be careful to use some rhymes, like in your rhymes and so forth, like in a lullaby poem, but not overdo it because I knew that I, it would be just our seal song. Mm -hmm. um, but that was kind of a, a different element that didn't exist in, yeah, in the first book and so on. But the landscape for me comes from images. Thank you. I feel like you're giving me a masterclass in, in these answers. So again, just thank you. Um, I have uh, one more for you, or I have two more actually, and then there are a few more that I will get to from our um, from the audience. But I just want to shout out, I read you as a poet who seemingly loves the body and writes about pleasure and taking pleasure from the body. And I love how frank and upfront you are when writing about the body. Can you talk to me about the sensual and the role it plays in your work? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for this question. Um, well, I found poets such as Lorca to be very useful, and mm -hmm. not just in um, the poetry, the wonderful poet, but the idea of poetry, the idea of Duanda, mm -hmm. Lorca, Say that I mentioned it earlier today to folks that uh, Lorca said, Port is a professor of five senses. He didn't say Port is a professor of creative writing at the university. Um, but so when we talk about lines, one has to ask, do, can I smell those lines? Can I bite those lines? Can I taste those lines? How do they speak to my senses? And if one can um, use that as a revision tool, Asking about every single line, one at a time. Can this line speak to my senses? And some don't, uh, but I have to have a reason for that. It can be just because it doesn't. It, it, it must not have senses for a reason. I must have some other need. Like sometimes um, senses can be overkill. 
so if I have a very charged message, then maybe the poem needs to be a little more flat, a little more quiet. If um, I have a quieter message, maybe poem can do something in the sound. Or if I'm worried about being sentimental, maybe the poem should do something in the sound and uh, distract the reader with music. So mm -hmm. they don't think it's sentimental, maybe it's they're there and then come with those feelings because they'll be hearing it as opposed to thinking about it. Um, I, I, I just want to go on. I think the most important thing for me in a book such as this is um, number one, I never thought myself as a poet of grief. Um, even though there were um, some very sad poems in them, you know, yes, I thought of it as a happy book. And uh, going to the Deaf Republic, I thought oh, I'm just going to write about, you know, married couple. Well, that didn't help me. Uh, but I realized that I, if you're writing about such charged material and you just write it from perspective of doom, 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 it's not just that you're not honoring your message and your characters and your narrative. Um, you also not really do the job as an artist because in the most dire situations, people still fall in love. People still have children, they get married, or they just stop and pet a, um, and pet a cat, you know, or, or they sit down under a tree and have a moment of quiet in the most dire of situations. And I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is one, they decide, oh, I'm writing about war, so it's all gonna be elegies and all gonna be horrible. Well, what kind of human are you gonna give me if it's so horrible? Humans are complicated creatures. They sometimes have a good mood, no matter what is happening. And we, we need to honor that. Then the tragedy is far more trustworthy, is far more real. Well, you know, a person inside the tragedy has every single right to have a good morning, no matter what. Forgive my tears. They come out because you are speaking the truth. Ah, <sighs> okay. Here's a question um, from earlier. When did you first know that your language had power? When did you first know that the, the language what? That your language had power. Uh, you double at all for very many years. Who knows what happens? You know, I can talk here in pretty sentences, but at the end of the day, I pray to have a poem. You know, it's uh, I'm not going to play here, you know, a poet who can write whatever, because I'm not that poet. I wish I was that poet, you know. Um, like, I have boxes of poems in my house that don't work, and they didn't make it into the book. I think one, tries to write a lot and then see what lasts three years later. Um, the, one, the only one real advice I have is don't hire to publish. Uh, even with these books, which took a long time, I published different versions of poems and different sequences. Like in the Poetry Magazine website, there is a very different story of the Republic. Even though there are some, some poems um, that are like the poems you'll find in the book. And then there's another magazine, there's, there's another 10 page sequence that is quite different. In fact, maybe only one page remains. Um, so I advocate publishing in journals because you can still change it. But really as a book, there is no hurry. I think time is the biggest um, helper to a writer mm -hmm. um, for me. And also my wife is the biggest help to me. She really reads everything and tells me when something doesn't work. Um, but sometimes I think it's really important to just read backwards. That's um, a trick from Emily Dickinson in her book. Uh, my Emily Dickinson, Susan Hall, um, is writing about Dickinson reading Bronte backwards. And if she could, why can't we? And I sometimes, you know, especially if you write a poem that's intense, you read it, you try to edit it, but the message is too passionate for you. So how do you distance yourself? And I find if I just read it one line at a time from the end to the beginning, and ask myself, is it line working, is it line working? Not from beginning to the end, because I get immediately caught up in the story of it, but from the end to the beginning. It's really kind of distant distance. So one hopes that 
the final draft will have power, but it's a long way. That, that is brilliant advice. And I really hope that everyone got that. Just read the poem backwards. That's brilliant. Um, we have another question here that I just put into the chat. And that is um, from one of the audience members. They said, why is God in Deaf Republic? What is he or she doing in it? I'm going to answer like a good you from USSR. I'm going to answer the question with a question. Why is God in my life and what is he or she doing in it? <laughs> I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> You know, the idea of God also changes all the time. The idea of silence changes all the time. Um, the, the, the idea of silence can be political, it can be metaphysical, it can be a daily reality, um, it can be an intimate language. Um, but there is also the idea of silence of God as God or silence as theology. Um, God, God is in the Republic because I come from Eastern Europe, uh, from Jewish background. And uh, no, I'm not a religious person, but am I a believer? Sure. I just don't believe in organized religion because in 2021, organized religion has become a corporation to my mind. But two people sitting at the kitchen table and talking to each other what matters and why we're here on this planet and what are we to do with that knowledge is the beginning of religion that I'm willing to participate. Last question. This pandemic has been difficult for many people. There are economic difficulties, health issues, and a psychological toll we've yet to understand. What has been, what have been your survival tools during this time? Are there poets you are reading who are providing you with a breath of fresh air? This has been a very hard day for many people. Um, unfortunately, um, my wife had cancer this year. So this has been the year of cancer for us even more than the year of pandemic. Um, so I may not be the best person to answer this question because uh, of that. But I try to, I wish I could write daily. I'm not lucky enough one day, uh, but I do try to read daily and that helps. Um, and I also, I don't feel that um, if I'm not writing poetry today, I can write an essay today. I can read an essay. Um, I find sometimes I'm one of those folks who like college, I like going to lectures, um, but I find these days that I can just read a smart essay and think about it all week later. Mm -hmm. And that gives me a kind of a consolation, a kind of solitude instead of loneliness. Um, I can be in conversation with what, whatever is in the, the subject of that essay, that um, I found to be a survival skill, sometimes even more so than a poem, because a poem is such a private thing, the poems I live with, like family members, you know, uh, but essays are a little easier, I can argue with them in a in less personal way. Mm -hmm. more, um, you know, when you're dealing with an illness, when you go to a hospital and you lip read and everybody wears a mask, it is kind of hard to think about how it breaks. Mm -hmm. um, but I can still think about the essays and that helps. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, beautiful advice. I, so this will wrap up our time. And I just want to say thank you again for being on this planet, being alive and writing what you were writing. And again, just a testimony from my heart to yours about how much it means to me. Thank you to our guest, Ilya Kaminsky, and our host, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society, Helco Polizzo, and Howard Community College for this amazing, amazing day. And thank you all to all of you who joined us this evening for the Nightbird Reading. To learn more about Helco Polizzo, its impressive roster of guests and upcoming events, visit hokopolitzo.org. We hope you join us next year in person and let there be lit. Thank you so much, Ilya. This has been such, such a blessing. And it's not a word I use often <laughs> as not one who believes in organized religion either, but it has, your words have been such a blessing. Thank you. 
Good evening. 